Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our HashiCorp Solutions Engineering Hangout hosted by Sean Carillon. Today, we're gonna to talk about HashiCorp Vault. HashiCorp Vault allows you to manage secrets and protect sensitive data across public and or private cloud. Sean is gonna show you how to use AWS native tools to rapidly spin up a highly available SSL secured production ready vault cluster in about five minutes. I also wanna know that the Hangout is recorded and the recording will be made available post-processing, usually within a day or two. I'll email it out to everyone. The demo will be about 20 minutes and then we'll allow up to 30 minutes afterward for questions. Please submit your questions throughout the demo through the Zoom Q&A portal and then we'll answer them at the end. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Take it away, Sean. Thanks, Allison. How's my sound? I like to do a sound check at the beginning. We're good? Okay, great. Welcome everyone. My name is Sean Carolyn, and I'm a technology specialist with HashiCorp. And today we're gonna to show you how to deploy a highly available vault cluster onto AWS in about five minutes. I wanted to say under five minutes, but I haven't quite broken the five minute barrier yet. If at any time you have questions, just drop them into the Q&A. Uh, Allison will keep an eye on those and we'll try to answer them at the end of the, of the webinar. I know many of you are working from home. Some folks may be newly working from home. HashiCorp is a remote first company. So we're doing more remote workshops and webinars like this one. You can actually learn all kinds of stuff on the internet. In fact, my daughter is taking a, a psychology class from the University of Queensland. So while we may have to stay physically separated, we could still be together in virtual environments. Also, it turns out that mom was right. We should all wash our hands, right? So we don't get infected with one of these little guys. Actually, this is just a harmless rhinovirus. While washing hands can protect us from viruses, Vault can help protect your infrastructure from attackers who wanna steal credentials or secret keys. This is my first computer. Well, not literally, this is not my actual computer. This one is sitting in a museum in Seattle. It's called the, the Living Computer Museum. I got my start with InfoSec and security by figuring out how to copy games for the um, Commodore 64 and share them with my friends. So the video game publishers caught on to this and, and they would create copy protection. And then the hackers would promptly figure out how to break the copy protection and copy the game on the disc. So some publishers would get creative and make you turn to page 42 of the manual and maybe type in the third word of the second paragraph before you could play the game. It was a crude method of authentication, a kind of way to prove that you'd actually purchase the game. So our solution was to use the photocopier at my dad's office to copy the manual. And so this game of cat and mouse would go on. Now disclaimer, this was in the days before don't copy that floppy, uh, the don't copy that floppy rap videos that came out in the 90s. Maybe some of you remember those. These days, I help organizations like yours build, secure, connect, and run their infrastructure with HashiCorp tools such as Vault. What is this Vault thing anyway? HashiCorp Vault is a multi-cloud API-driven secrets management system. You can use it to store passwords, keys, certificates, anything that you really don't wanna leave lying around in plain text. Vault can also handle many kinds of encryption and credentials management. You can use Vault to dispense temporary cloud credentials, encrypt sensitive data like credit card numbers, or manage SSL certificates for your applications. You can find a complete list of all Vault secrets engines on the Vault project website. So think of it not as a single purpose tool, but more like a Swiss army knife that you can use for all sorts of secrets management. This is the traditional security model. We're gonna use the analogy of the castle and moat. So this is like your data center. You have a big building, tight physical security, maybe a couple of high throughput network connections coming in and out of the building. Then you might wanna put some firewalls and IDS devices and load balancers and so on at the ingress and egress points. And in this model, the outside world is not trusted. It's scary and dangerous. 
And the inside of the castle is considered to be a safe and trustworthy environment. Things were a lot simpler back then. It was easier to know what was you know, safe and not safe. But as we move to a cloud or a, a hybrid cloud environment, things get a lot more difficult to defend. The perimeter of this infrastructure is not even clear. Now you no longer own the network or the infrastructure underneath because you're simply renting it from your cloud provider. How can you protect your infrastructure when there's no clear network perimeter? And there's no longer a concept of inside and outside because quite frankly, everything is outside. Even your so-called internal networks have to be considered zero trust. In this photo, we see some nomadic people in Mongolia and they're living in yurts, not too different than what their ancestors used hundreds of years ago. Now this analogy is not perfect, but it gives you an idea of how Vault sees the world. The old way here was big and heavy and inflexible and hard to change. The new way is lightweight, dynamic, changeable, and based on identity. Vault can even run on untrusted networks that you don't even own or control. And this brings us to the idea of identity-based security. Now in the past, we might have restricted access to networks via IP address and port. Now instead, we're interested in the identity of the person or the application requesting access. Here's another analogy to help us understand how Vault works. Imagine that you're going on a trip and you're ready to check into your hotel. You approach the front desk and what's the first thing they ask you at the check-in counter? Can I please see some valid form of identification, sir or ma'am? It might be a driver's license or a passport or other type of ID. Now, once you've authenticated yourself, the hotel staff will give you a special card a card key that has limited restricted access to different parts of the hotel. That key will open your room. It'll probably grant access to the gym and maybe even the front door if it's after hours. If you lose your key, no big deal. Just approach the front desk, identify yourself, and they'll make you another key. These card keys are good just for a couple of days after which they expire and they no longer work. So once you're registered hotel reservation ends, the key is no longer valid and it won't unlock the door anymore. So in the same way, Vault can become the centerpiece of your secrets management infrastructure. If the hotel is all of your services and applications and cloud APIs, then Vault is like that central front desk that grants you access. This diagram illustrates in a nutshell how Vault works. Humans and applications approach Vault and they identify themselves. So that's this authentication part down here in the left, uh, lower left corner. Based on their identity and roles, these entities are granted a policy that opens up access to specific resources. You don't get to just go wander the entire hotel and open any, every single door. Access is restricted and it is time limited. This is all managed by tokens that Vault provides to authenticated users. And this brings us to secrets engines, or as we used to call them, backends. These are the, the motors or the engines of Vault. This is where you either store your secrets or generate secrets or somehow manage some you know, private infrastructure. So Vault, again, is like a, more like a Swiss army knife than a single purpose tool. You can store your secrets in Vault just like you do with a password manager. Many of us have password managers on our phones or on our laptops. Vault can do that too. So you can store all your passwords. Anything that you, you know, have lying around in plain text shouldn't be lying around in plain text. Put it into Vault. You can also generate dynamic credentials for your cloud provider or databases in the same way that the hotel desk generates those temporary keys. You can even encrypt data in applications that were not originally designed to support encryption using what we call the transit engine. You can also think of this as encryption as a service. Vault is very flexible. It can be used via the command line, the GUI. There's an nice UI, which we'll see during the demo. And we also have a RESTful API. So all of Vault endpoints are accessible via an API, which 
makes it uniquely suited for automated tasks. Now, we don't have time today to go into all of Vault's internals, but just know that all secrets that are stored in Vault are always encrypted, both at rest and in transit. Vault can help you eliminate secret sprawl and centralize management of all of those sensitive passwords, credentials, and certificates that you might have lying around your network. There are a bunch of moving parts inside Vault. You can see some of them here in the diagram. The main takeaway that I want you to remember is that everything, and I mean everything inside a Vault, is encrypted. Vault doesn't trust anything outside of itself, including the operating system and even the network that it's running on. That means that Vault is, is uniquely suited to running on infrastructure that you don't own or control, like your public cloud providers, such as AWS. Vault puts you in charge or puts you in control of your own destiny and allows you to manage secrets on AWS where even AWS employees can't read them. So the secrets are under your control, even on someone else's network. So you may be wondering, um, how do I get this nifty multi-purpose secrets engine installed into my cloud account? Uh, this used to be hard. It's not a simple process because there are actually quite a few moving parts. If you've ever had to build a highly available application, you know that means it's running on a cluster of machines, not just a single machine. And if one or two of those machines fails, this cluster is designed to stay up and running. A properly configured vault cluster should be able to withstand a natural disaster, like a tornado or a meteor strike. Well, maybe a small meteor strike. Now, you might be curious why we have eight separate machines in the vault cluster. Three of them are Vault servers, and those are indicated here with the Vault uh, logo on them. And then there are five console servers on the back end that serve as our storage device. A console is another HashiCorp tool. It's a network discovery slash uh, management tool, but it can also be used as a storage device. So that's what we're doing here. We're using console as a distributed storage device. Think of these console servers as a low latency distributed storage disk a little bit like a SAN or maybe a RAID array. The basic idea is to distribute the data across multiple locations so that if any two of them fail, your cluster will still remain operational. All the data is encrypted, but we store it in five separate locations, just in case part of the server, uh, the cluster becomes unavailable. Now, besides the eight cloud instances required to run our standard production architecture vault cluster, there are several other parts that need to be configured. You need a valid SSL certificate for secure communication. And we also need a load balancer in front of the vault cluster to route our traffic to the back end nodes. So a lot of moving parts. Now as a side note, if you want a more compact cluster that still offers high availability, you can check out the new integrated storage option for vault. This allows you to run a three node vault cluster that can tolerate the loss of a single node. This feature is currently in beta at the time of this webinar. So if you'd like, you can download the beta and check that out. Um, today though, we're gonna focus on the standard classic um, reference architecture for pr production vault cluster, which is what you see here in the diagram. So that brings us to the main topic of today's webinar. How do I get vault installed on AWS without spending hours becoming an expert in HashiCorp tools. I'm sure a lot of you folks came in, saw the headline, hey, five minutes, that sounds great. Uh, this would be a very short webinar if all I did was run the deployment code and, and call it a day. So what we're gonna do is explore the method and process by which Vault gets stood up in AWS, so you understand it a little better. And then we'll do a live demo showing you um, how to build and tear down a Vault cluster using CloudFormation. So installing in Vault, it doesn't need to be difficult anymore. Um, you can actually use infrastructure as code to distill all the build steps into a simple document that defines the entire environment. So you may be thinking to yourself, he's gonna say Terraform, or why aren't we using Terraform to do this? And it's true, HashiCorp uh, has a tool called Terraform. It's an infrastructure as code tool and language that allows you to build cloud infrastructure on any platform. 
You can even install vaults with Terraform. But not every shop uses Terraform. You may already be using CloudFormation for your other infrastructure. The great thing about HashiCorp tools is you can use them separately or together. In other words, you don't require any Terraform expertise to get up and running with Vault. So with that, we're ready to do a live demo. I'm gonna go ahead and bring up the code, talk a little bit about um, what's getting built while we kick off a build and see if we can break that five minute barrier or maybe, maybe get close to it. All right, so let me go ahead and share. I'm gonna share my entire desktop here. So you can see everything. All right. So this is the CloudFormation template that I mentioned. And if you haven't used it before, um, CloudFormation is AWS's native infrastructure as code tool. Basically what you do is you define all of the stuff you wanna build in, a, in this giant YAML file. And then um, everything you defined as code gets built in your AWS account without having to you know, manually intervene. So you can see there are a whole lot of different resources here, collapsing some of these, 72 in total. So 72 different moving pieces required. That's kind of why we use infrastructure as code, because we don't want to go building all this stuff by hand and trying to keep track of it all, right? So we've got a CloudFormation template. This is already built out for you to build that same eight node reference architecture. And wherever possible inside the CloudFormation template, um, we've tried to use native AWS tools wherever possible. So you can see some stuff in here like uh, KMS, key management server. What are we using that for? Well, we're gonna use that to unseal our vault cluster. When you first start up vault, it comes up in a sealed state. And usually there's this process where, you know, two or three people have to get together and enter their secret codes and then the vault cluster is unsealed. Well, you don't always have access to those two or three people. Um, it can be a pain to, to get folks up in the middle of the night to unseal the vault cluster. So what you can do is if you trust your cloud provider, in other words, we trust AWS to manage this you know, key and keep it safe. We could just store the master key for vault and KMS and highly restrict who and what is allowed to access it. So in this example here, we're only allowing the servers that need to talk to that key or to fetch that key to get access to it. We're also using AWS Route 53 for DNS records. Uh, we're using Certificate Manager for the built-in um, SSL certificate generation and renewal. So it's kind of a long template. As you can see it's about Oh, about 1,350 lines of code. And this has got everything you need. So it's one single file. So that's the first prerequisite, is you need to have this file. Where do you get it? You might be curious, where do I get this file? Uh, there's this Git repo here called Vault AWS CF. We'll make this available afterwards. Um, this will also be in the recording. But if you want to grab it now or take a look at the code now, I'll make it a little bigger so folks can see it in the webinar. So those are the goods. If you just came for the code, that's where you need to go. All right. So for fun, let's let's uh, let's see how long it's going to take to do this. I'll put up the timer, and I can keep talking while we kick off a build. I also see a question, so we'll get to that in a moment. All right, I've got a little shortcut here. This is basically just running a CloudFormation command behind the scenes. On your marks, get set, go. Oops. Okay, we'll just start the stopwatch. Okay, we need to add like four seconds to it when it's uh, when it's done. So that CloudFormation command was kicked off. I've got my list of stacks here. And now that create is beginning. So in testing, 
Um, closest I got to five minutes was five minutes and two seconds. So if you round down, yeah, you could save all cluster in five minutes. All right, so let's walk through some of the pieces of this and describe um, you know, in a little more detail what the architecture looks like. I'm also gonna take a look. Okay, it looks like that question disappeared, so we're good. All right, so CloudFormation. Feed it a template, hit the go button, and then out pops your infrastructure, right? That's the idea. Um, there is one manual step. So after, after this automated run finishes, I'm gonna walk through using the GUI, because I know most folks probably wanna use the UI the first time they do this before tackling the command line. Okay, so here are all our resources. Same resources that were defined in code now are actually manifesting and, and being built according to our instructions. Now, one that I wanna focus in on is the vault certificate. One of the toughest things, honestly, about installing a vault cluster is getting the SSL correct, right? It's hard. It's hard to get the SSL cert and install it, make sure you generate it correctly. Um, a lot of folks don't want the hassle of having to remember to renew it either. So AWS offers a nice solution for this called AWS Certificate Manager. Here we can actually automatically generate and renew SSL certificates without ever having to, you know, mess with them or, or touch them, right? The whole process can be automated. But there is one little step you have to complete and that is validating your domain name, okay? Now this has already happened because I, I, I did it beforehand, but I'll show you this step with the next build that we do manually. In essence, what you're doing is you're proving that you own the domain name that you want your SSL certificate for. And in technical terms, um, we're adding a DNS record. So what we do is we, we create a little DNS record that signals to AWS Certificate Manager that, hey, yes, this is a legitimate request for a certificate. We are gonna go ahead and issue the certificate. So in our case, the DNS record was already written to the zone because I pre-created it. Why did I pre-create it? Well, the first time you do this, it can take up to 30 minutes to create um, the, the first SSL certificate. So if you, if you need speed and you want this to spin up really fast, what you want to do is have the DNS record pre-configured. Okay, and I'll show you that in a moment. So what do we get? We get an SSL certificate. And this is the website where our, our vault cluster is going to live. Now that brings us to the second prerequisite, which is a DNS record, or a DNS zone rather, Route 53 zone. You need to own a domain or control a domain that you can create uh, subdomains or a host zone in. So in our account here, we've got a parent domain called hashidemos.io, and I'm using this zone called fto.hashidemos.io. Here are the verification records, and then AWS is able to automatically create my vault um, DNS record for me inside of here. So you can see how we're, we're um, using AWS native services wherever possible. Now, the good news is if you, if you don't um, have a Route 53 zone, or maybe you work somewhere that has its own DNS, you can still use this code. You just have to be able to create the verification record so that ACM will agree to create your SSL certificate for you. So that's the one manual step. Everything else 100% automated. And the good news is you only need to do it once. So our first prerequisite, um, have the code, right? Have your CloudFormation template. And then you need a DNS zone, either hosted in AWS or hosted on your own. And then the third thing is you need some images. You need AMIs, in other words, these Amazon machine images. These are basically just pre-configured Linux servers with Vault and or console installed on them. Now you can install them manually or if you go to the code repository here, you can see there's um, a directory called Packer, another favorite tool from HashiCorp. 
Packer lets you easily build these machine images. Now we've got lots and lots of Packer tutorials and stuff. So if you, if you want to learn Packer, um, just go and check out our learning portal. It's really pretty easy. I built these machines with a single command and um, once they're built, they get used in the template. So if you've got all those prerequisites, let's see, I'm in the wrong folder. This is what you get. What are, what are we building here? Well, you get a VPC or a virtual private cloud with three public and three private subnets. Speaking of which, we're coming up on minute six. So let's take a look. Let's see how far this has gone. Yeah, it's complete. Okay, so the high side of five minutes, let's call it that. Or I'll just change the title of the webinar to six minutes or less. When it's done, you'll see some outputs and Bolt can take a minute or two to kind of warm itself up. So you might see this bad gateway for, for a few minutes while Vault is sorting itself out and putting all its prerequisites in place. We'll come back to that. Um, the operating system we chose for Vault and console is CentOS 7. We support pretty much any flavor of Linux. So, you know, it's up to you really what you want to run it on. I picked CentOS because it's fairly common. We also include a Bastion host. Well, we need this. Why do we need it? Because the, the Vault servers are actually in a private network that cannot be accessed from the internet. So inside of this VPC, remember I mentioned there are three public and three private subnets. All the Vault and console servers live on the private subnets. In the public subnet, we've got um, our Bastion host, right? And the Bastion host really is the only way to SSH in, uh, you know, unless you turn on um, AWS, uh, what is it called? Systems manager. Um, there's no back door, in other words, to these vault clusters. The only port we expose from the cluster is port 8200. That's the standard port for vault, uh, the vault API. And that's exposed on the load balancer. So this is a pretty secure configuration. Um, if you shut that Bastion host off, there really is no other way to interact with Vault other than the API. So we want minimal exposure to the internet as much as possible. So that's what that Bastion host is for. Uh, you get an SSL certificate. I showed you that in AWS certificate, Man Amazon certificate manager. You get automatic unsealing. So in other words, you can reboot your Vault cluster and it will automatically unseal and start working again. This is handy in case of outages or, you know, Maybe you need to patch the OS and reboot or whatnot. Um, while the Vault you know, instance will stand up pretty fast, sometimes it can take up to 10 minutes for Vault to be completely ready. So we'll come back and, and check here again. And yeah, this one's ready. So this is the initial freshly installed Vault configuration screen. Uh, there's nothing in it yet. And this is where you generate your master key in case you needed to unseal the vault. So this is, you can generate the master key. One copy goes into KMS and you're recommended to keep your own copy in a, in a physical vault or a safe. Okay, we've got some basic instructions for use. There will also be a blog post to accompany this webinar and that will have a lot more detail with screenshots and everything. So. Um, Hang tight at the end, we'll, uh, we'll give you the link either at the end or afterwards, share out the link to the, to the blog post. And then you can kind of follow along um, with you know, each individual step. Okay, I'm gonna save this question till the end. Let's keep moving on here. So you've seen the command line way to stand up Vault. Let's walk through it in the GUI because that may be more comfortable and familiar for many of us. I'm going to switch to a different region. We'll go over to US West 2. And we'll kind of walk through the process of, of installing Vault by hand, if you will. Click Create Stack with new resources. I've already got my template, so I'm going to say template is ready. You have a choice. You can uh, either park your template in S3. That makes it convenient to reuse it over and over again or you can upload a template file. 
I'll just pop down in here. Yeah, and that's our YAML source file. And this is kind of fun. You can actually, if you want to visualize what the network looks like, you can now view these in Designer if you click that box. OK, now we need to enter some required information. First is a stack name. This is um, pretty arbitrary as long as you stick to letters, numbers, and dashes. So let's just do uh, alt demo. First, we need to choose a host name. So what host name should we use for our vault cluster? Looks like I've already taken that one. Oops. We'll choose something different. So let's just call it vault west fto And then we need to choose three availability zones. The reason for three is so that if one of those zones goes down, your vault cluster will still keep running. So this is how the CloudFormation knows you know, which zones to spread out the, the cluster to. So I'm choosing US West 2 A, B, and C. SSH key is important. If you want to ever connect to your vault servers, you'll need a valid SSH key to do that. So you can upload these and then just choose one. And then I am using AWS Route 53 for DNS. So I'm going to set this to true. And then this has to match the same as whatever we put up here, right? So our, our zone is fto.hashidemos.io. And then the final one is the AMI for the Bastion host. You actually don't have to change this because we just take the latest Amazon Linux and use that for the Bastion host. Optionally tag. Tagging is good. You should always tag your resources in AWS. So I'll do the right thing here. At least put an owner tag in here. And the rest of the options can be left as default. Don't need to change anything. Now there is one last little box that you will need to check down here at the bottom on the final screen. This warning is here to let you know that the CloudFormation template is going to create identity and access management resources. The reason that you get a warning is because this is sensitive. In other words, if I created another admin user, that could be considered a security risk, right? Now, you might be wondering, well, why does Vault need to create users and IAM resources? Um, what essentially is happening is we're creating some roles that allow our vault machines to talk to AWS KMS and Secrets Manager. It's not some nefarious thing where we you know, are creating extra admin accounts. It's really to make it more secure, right? So that's why this is here. You have to acknowledge that CloudFormation is gonna do this. Once you check the box, you can click Create Stack and away we go. So the build has begun. And if you wanna watch it in real time, you can kind of reload the events page here see all of these things start to spring to life. But um, resources is where we see what is actually complete. So the one resource you need to watch out for is the certificate. As I mentioned earlier, there's that one manual step of verifying your DNS. We're going to want to do that. So as soon as the certificate appears here on the list, we'll have a link we can click to kind of automatically create that DNS record. There it is. Okay. So the, the creation is initiated. And in a moment, you'll see a little like link here. A link will appear on the side that says, hey, you need to verify this before we can proceed. We'll just give it another another few seconds here to uh, reach that stage. Or we can just hop over and check it. It may already be there. Let's go into Certificate Manager. Yeah, okay. 
So pending validation. If you don't do this, um, your CloudFormation run will hang. So just a little warning. Uh, the first time you run this, you need to come in here and see the DNS record. Or if you have your own DNS, you know, you're creating this in your, your DNS uh, public zone. And you got to kind of fold these little arrows out to see the blue button. All right. So once you click this and click create, a DNS record just got created. And that will allow the CloudFormation build to complete. So this actually is going to take a little while. Uh, it could be 20, even 25 minutes. That's just the way it is. We can't speed it up because um, it just takes that long sometimes for DNS to propagate and the, the SSL certificate to be verified. The good news is I've already built three vault clusters that we can play with. So let's start with the fresh one, the new vault cluster. I've just stood up my brand new vault cluster. I'm ready to use it. Uh, what's my first step? Well, I need to create a master key. And because we're using AWS for the unseal, um, I only need one key share. We don't need to overcomplicate this by making extra key shares. So we're going to do one key share with a threshold of one. Now, if you were doing manual unseals, you'd probably break this into three or maybe five shards. Remember that movie, Hunt for Red October? Anyone's old enough to remember that. Or perhaps war games where you have the two, you know, the two uh, soldiers are, are turning the key at the same time. Vault has the same concept. If you want to split the master key into three or five shards, you can do that, but you've got to assemble all the, you know, all of Voltron together to unlock Vault. This is much easier. Many operators prefer auto unseal because once I click initialize here, there's no further intervention required on my part. Unseal happens at boot time. So without further ado, let's initialize. All right, so you're going to get two pieces of information after you initialize your vault cluster. The initial root token, that is like the master key. Everyone's going to go, go hack my vault server now. This is what I can use to log on. So I might. I might save this or drop it into a text file. Um, in case you're wondering about like best practice for this file, you might stick it on a USB drive and lock it in the safe, seriously. Like put it in a physical safe or a locked drawer or print it out on a piece of paper and put that in the drawer and lock it up, okay? That is good, good hygiene. It's good to have a backup copy just in case, you know, just in case you need it but you shouldn't need it. In most circumstances, it's safely stored in KMS now, and that's the key here. That is the master root token. So you'd wanna store both of those actually. Now I'm gonna click continue to authenticate. One thing you may notice is that um, right after you initialize a brand new vault, it can thrash a little bit. Sometimes it, it, you know, it takes a moment to pick a master. I didn't cover this yet, but in that three node vault cluster, you'll always have one primary that is accepting writes and reads. So the load balancer is gonna point at the, at the leader or the primary. And sometimes it just takes a moment for the health check to catch up and know which is the primary. So let me go ahead and put my token in. And now I'm logged on. At this point, you might go ahead and start adding your admin users and then use the admin user from that point forward to manage a vault cluster. We don't recommend using your root token for everything. Why? Because it's hard to know who used it. And it's super powerful, right? The root token can do everything across the entire cluster. So that's a quick overview of both the command line setup of Vault. You saw me run that and I can expose the command for you. Just use the AWS CloudFormation command line using essentially the same parameters that I use to create these Vault clusters here. Then we covered the GUI.
you've got the UI, you can simply browse to CloudFormation, click Create Stack, and then fill in the information by hand. And the first time you build, in about 15 or 20 minutes, out will pop your, your freshly minted vault cluster. Now, I mentioned that this would be highly available. Let's test it and make sure that it really is highly available. So what I can do here is just hit the, uh, the health endpoint of the API. And that's the wrong vault server. So let's go with the one that we're working with. What do we call it? Vault demo. All right. Now we'll just continually do this in a loop and you can see what the health of the vault server looks like. We'll add a little sleep in between just so not to overwhelm my machine. Okay, so that's nice. That'll give us a kind of running tally of, is my vault alive or not? My monitoring system. We don't even need these either. Or we can just help hit the health endpoint. Yeah. Good. Okay. So now we'll leave that running. We'll kind of resize this window here. And now we get to play whack a mole or whack a vault server. I'm going to go in to EC2. And what we're going to do is simulate an outage. I've got a handful of instances. Uh, this is the this is the one in East, so I need to switch to East. And we're going to kick out the chair from under one of these vault vault instances. We'll just narrow this to just the vault machines. Vault demo. All right, why don't we do server one? So I'm just gonna stop vault server one and we'll see what happens to the API, if there's any hiccup or not. Ah, see, okay. So now we had a little hiccup when it hit that gateway right at the moment that it was down but pretty quickly you can see the load balancer goes, oh, whoa, we better find another primary. And it starts failing traffic over to one of those other nodes so that your applications can continue to access Vault. Let me need to reload here. Okay, it's still thrashing a bit. So the failover sometimes can take a minute or two while, oh, there we go. Okay, so we're back in business. It is not instantaneous. Um, if you need that level of failover, uh, talk to us. You can, you can hit us up offline. And there are other configurations of Vault that you can use for, you know, like millisecond failover. And we have some clients who need that, that level. Um, but if you can tolerate a couple of seconds of downtime for an accidental reboot or occasional blip in the radar, uh, this configuration is actually quite robust. All right. So that kind of brings us to the end of the demo. I'm going to pivot over and look at the chat and also take some questions. Just put that back there. All right. So I'm scrolling back a little bit in chat. Great. Um, I'll queue up your question for you, Sean. Um, okay. Do we have similar instructions for vSphere and or a local VMware workstation? Um, we, we do. I have some scripts that you can use. Um, of course, you can't use CloudFormation, right, <laughs> in, in vSphere. But let me ask my coworkers about the Terraform. I certainly have the bash scripts required to install Vault and console. 
So the short answer is if you can bring eight VMs and, and stick a load balancer in front of them, we, we can help you automate this. Great. Um, can you spread a vault cluster across multiple regions? No, we don't recommend that. In fact, we have an alternative called replication. So instead, what you'd do is you'd have two vault clusters like I have here. I have a vault in US West 2. I have another vault in the US East. And then I could connect them with either of two methods. So the first method is what we call performance replication. That means all your secrets will be available on all the vault clusters and um, you can have fast access to all of your secrets from anywhere. The second method is called disaster replication and that's intended for a complete regional loss. So if, if uh, you know, an entire region or data center went down, you could quickly recover and redirect traffic to the secondary without having to force all your applications to re-authenticate. I should also point out that replication is a, uh, an enterprise feature. If that's something you need, come and talk to us. What you get with open source is uh, HA, right, within a region. And the reason for that is not just because we want to make money selling replication. Um, there are technical reasons for that as well. Within the region in AWS, all of these zones, A, B, and C, are connected by very high speed, low latency, high bandwidth connections, right? And that is super critical, both for Vault and for console, right? So both the storage backend and the Vault cluster really, really need, you know, basically like 10 millisecond or less latency between nodes to, to work effectively. And um, when we've seen folks try to try to span a vault cluster across regions, it generally doesn't go well because of the, the, uh, the latency. Now that said, if you have a fiber link between your data centers and you can provide that, then you probably could do it. But uh, most of us would rather lean on AWS and let them take that headache instead. Is there an example Terraform script that deploys a similar cluster? Yeah. In fact, our um, enterprise architecture team has built some modules that you can use. And I'll see if I can, I can post those um, in the follow-up. Great. And do you have an example of a similar deployment that uses the new integrated RAF storage instead of console as a backend? Ooh, not yet, but I, I want to build one as soon as I get time. I'm actually moonlighting. Um, I'm the Terraform specialist here, but they let me play with Vault sometimes too. Perfect. So, yeah, as soon as that's ready, we'll publish it and make sure that you can you can uh, take it for a spin. Cool. I think that's all the questions we had. So thank you for your expertise on those, Sean. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, this Hangout was recorded and we will make the recording available on our website after processing. I'll send an email to everyone who registered with that recording link. If you liked what you heard today and want to start exploring Vault, I encourage you to check out our Learn site. You can find it on our website at learn.hashicorp.com slash vault. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's hangout and have a better understanding of vault, which allows you to secure, store, and tightly control access. Thanks for hanging out with us today. And a big thank you to Sean for his time. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Allison. Bye.